It's such an honor to come into your homes today. I get the opportunity of opening the scripture, and I, I take that very seriously. Um, I- anytime we open the scripture, we want Jesus to get bigger, the cross to work better, the resurrection to be central, and scriptures to get bigger, not smaller. I hope that we can bring something out of scripture and be inspired by some of these stories um, to live life that exemplifies Christ in our world as we go out today. So I want to talk to you about anxiety. Um, anxiety is one of those things that it's, it's a buzzword, and, 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 and because of that, one of the things that frustrated me, particularly when I was a, a younger teenager, is when well-meaning people used platitudes to explain scriptural things. So, so like, like when, when the word anxiety come up, right? You, you, have, your, you have your scripture. They, they even used to have these things where you would put in the topic, you know, and, and it would spit out all the scripture references that would solve that topic for you. So, so for instance, if, if somebody said, well, I'm struggling with a bit of worry or anxiety, and this, so you could easily quote Jesus, you know, give no thought about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, have enough cares of. Just be present here. Or, or Peter saying, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Or, or Paul, like be anxious for nothing, but with everything by prayer and supplication, right? So you got, you've, got these, you've got these awesome scriptural truths, but with not a whole lot of language around it. So a platitude would be something like, well, you know, listen, you just quit worrying because the Bible says don't worry. Or just give it to Jesus because the Bible says give it to Jesus with no language around what that might actually look like. Although that is a profound truth, we need language uh, to what that might actually look like tomorrow. So my goal today is to open up this, this, um, this topic in a way that my goal is to put some language around it that will help us deal with it. And so, sometimes preaching is like bullet-pointed bullets, literally like this, 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 this. Today, I want to do something that's more like buckshot, like more like it, a spread, because my goal is, is that somebody on this might get it here and somebody over here might get it another way. And so we can pick up something that can help us with this. So, so let's talk about anxiety and then let's talk about some solutions for it. The, the word in the New Testament translated anxiety or, wor- or worry is the word merimnao. Now, one of the things when we talk about words is words are important. But what's more important than the words are our imagination of how that word functions. So if I say all-powerful, if we picture all-controlling, that's not going to help us at all with how actual power functions. So if I say anxiety, if all we picture is I'm worrying about something, it's not wrong. It's just only one side of the diamond, and we need to, we need to twist it to see different dimensions of it. So let me give you a few definitions of this word that gets translated worry or anxiety in the New Testament. The word is merimnao. And it, could, it actually literally means to be split apart, to be divided or distracted. Uh, one way to think about it is, is anxiety isn't just worry. Anxiety is anytime you're here 
but you're actually there in your head. So you're here right now, but with the failure to be fully present, you're actually somewhere else entirely. So you're here with your daughter, but you're thinking about a business meeting tomorrow, which then cheapens the time with your daughter. And then when you're at the business meeting tomorrow, you're thinking about the time that you should have been fully present with your daughter. So in, in, in point of fact, both actually get robbed of something. That's anxiety. Anxiety is anytime we're here, but we're actually there. Figuratively, it could be translated to go to pieces. And, and we would use that as a metaphor regularly ourselves. Like, like, like oh, I just, I'm so worried. I feel like I'm going to pieces. It's, it's literally a failure to be present. And, and the scriptures have a lot to say about it. Jesus says, don't don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have enough cares for itself. In other words, Jesus' challenge on how to live the best life was, allow yourself to be disciplined enough to be fully present in this moment right here, that you don't want to miss what God has for you right here, thinking about what tomorrow might bring. P Peter says it, to cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. So there's this idea of being able to give it away to something else. Paul in Philippians chapter 4, he talks about it as well. And, and this is quite inspiring if you look at Paul's story because at, the, at this point, Paul's being tortured on a daily basis by a guy named Nero who eventually is going to kill him. And so Paul's writing this letter back about, you know, don't be anxious for anything. He's writing this from a torturous Roman jail cell. And, and here's what he says in Philippians 4 verse 4. We're going to look at four, five, six, seven, and eight eventually. Re rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. So for Paul, the cure for anxiety is rejoicing, which brings me back to platitudes. Platitudes are things that are obviously true, but then we lack language if we're asked one question about it. So like if someone said, listen, just walk in the Spirit, and you go, what's it mean to walk in the Spirit? And they go, well, to walk in the Spirit means you're walking in the Spirit. What we need is better language around this. So if someone said, well, look, if you're, if you're struggling with anxiety, the cure for that's to rejoice. Just rejoice, man. Just rejoice. Well, once again, what does that mean? And it's really important because Paul says it twice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. So what does it mean to be joyful? Let me see if I can put some language around this that might help us grasp it a bit better. Rejoicing is a disciplined awareness of God being up to something in the middle of all things. So rejoicing isn't this just willy-nilly happiness. It's actually from a jail cell being aware that God is weaving in and out of the situation, that God is at work in everything we are facing. Rejoicing is the ability to see God's hand moving in and out and through all things. That is rejoicing. Rejoicing isn't just on the end where we get out of something. Rejoicing is being able to see and live in an awareness of God in the middle of that something. Number two, rejoicing is learning to perceive things that run counter to how we have been taught the world works. So Paul, who is doing nothing wrong but spreading compassion and inclusivity and saying, hey, Christ is for the whole world, he ends up on death row. Life's not supposed to work that way. But rejoicing is being able to go, wait a minute, when confronted with life not working how we were taught it's supposed to work, that God is in the middle of something shifting the situation. That's rejoicing. The, number three, rejoicing is being aware of how precious life actually is. In other words, don't let anything take us out of the beautiful, holy moment in front of us right now. Now, sometimes when we face hardships and, and those hardships confront the things we used to think were important. Like if you've, I, I, I remember one time um, I choked, it's only happened to me once, but, but I choked at a Thai restaurant down the road here. A, a piece of calamari went down my windpipe. I could not get a breath. And when I couldn't get a breath, it confronted everything in me that I thought was important other than breath. When you can't breathe, the importance of breath becomes very important and it confronts the things that we thought were more important because we were taking breath 
for granted. Rejoicing is any time we're in a moment where we can see God at work in me, God at work in them, God at work in the whole world, and the whole thing's going somewhere beautiful. Because the one thing that the narrative of Scripture promises us is that God is at work in this world reconciling the whole broken thing to himself. So when we, no matter what our circumstances are, can step back and go, wait a minute, God's up to something in me, God's up to something in them, God's up to something in the whole world, and the whole thing is heading where God wants it to go. When we become aware of that, even when it's a trial or a hardship or a storm or whatever metaphor we want to use, even in the middle of that, when we're aware that God is at work in it, that is rejoicing. So number one, we want to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Number two, let your gentleness be made known to all for the Lord is near. This is the very next verse. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all for the Lord is near. There's two thoughts in there. One, that the Lord is in fact near. Once again, rejoicing that God is at work in my circumstance, that God is at work in me, God's at work in them, and and God's at work in the whole world and the whole thing is going somewhere beautiful for God is reconciling the whole world to himself. In Christ Jesus. And so you got that, but you, so you have this idea that the Lord is near. And then you have the fruit of that, which is as soon as I'm aware that the Lord is near, it should manifest in gentleness and kindness, a countenance of disposition, of gentleness. God, let your gentleness be made known to all. I think we should probably stop right there and meditate on that for a second and, 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 and ask the question Does my awareness of the presence of God lead naturally to gentleness? Let's just wrestle with that for a second. Does my awareness of God, like when I'm fully aware that God is near, does it manifest naturally in gentleness? And if it doesn't, maybe the problem isn't God and maybe the problem isn't you. Maybe the problem is our imagination of what God is like. Because if we picture God as a mean, caustic, vicious, vindictive person and we're aware of him, then that'll manifest in us here because we become what we worship. So Paul's making a point that when you're aware of the presence of God all in and around you, because God is near, that should lead to rejoicing and it should manifest itself in gentleness. That Paul, to manifest gentleness to people torturing him would have been a major act of faith. So let's, let's observe some things around this. Number one, to earnestly seek and know that the Lord is near. The Lord is calling us to be aware of him in the present, not in mental assent to the past, which is regret, or in mental assent to the future, which is worry. Essentially, Jesus, Peter, Paul, they they all challenge us that the best life is don't put too much emphasis on the past, that's regret, and don't put too much emphasis on the future, that's worry. Be aware of what God is up to right now and embrace that, for God is near, for, and with us at all times times. And that should manifest itself in gentleness. Here, here's a psalm, a poem that was written to sort of describe this. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. In other words, the psalmist is saying, I love the presence of God so much. I'd rather be there than have any of this other stuff. But the question is, is when we are there, when we're aware of the presence of God, because God is always with us, The only thing that changes is our awareness of it. When we're aware of the presence of God, what does that manifest in us? Does it manifest gentleness? Now, here's the question. What then is anxiety? Anxiety is a failure to be here. It's I'm here, but I'm actually there. And so when we're anxious, being here, but actually there, we lose the opportunity and the privilege to rejoice. What is rejoicing? Rejoicing is being aware that God is up to something in me. God is up to something in them. God's up to something in the whole world and the whole thing is going somewhere beautiful. So what causes that? I think four things, I mean, anxiety is much more complex than four things, but for one talk, we need to talk about it in four things. Four things, one, unresolved conflict. Two, unresolved guilt. Three, unresolved questions. And four, unrealized control. So I'm going to say those four things again, and then we're going to talk about them. One, unresolved conflict. Two, unresolved guilt. Three, unresolved questions. And four, unrealized 
control. So let's talk through all four. One, unreal, unreal, unresolved conflict. Conflict causes anxiety. This is those moments where we've all faced this, right? Where there's a courageous conversation that you know you have to have. You know eventually you're not gonna be able to avoid it. You're gonna have to have it. And we put it off. Why do we put it off? Because our imagination of how bad that conversation is gonna go is almost always worse than the actual conversation. And so we put it off and we wait and we wait and we wait and we, put, and we agonize over the thought of having that conversation. And then what does that do? It makes us have imaginary conversations about how it's gonna go. And we all love imaginary conversations because imaginary conversations is the one place in our life we can always win. Listen, if you're losing imaginary conversations, get your head checked, it's your imagination, you can actually win that conversation. What happens is, is in our imaginary conversation, our worry gets worse. What does that mean? It means that if I'm here, but I'm imagining a conversation there, I can't possibly be present in what God is doing in my life right here. I lose my awareness of what God's doing, me, them, and the whole world because of that. And so sometimes the cure for anxiety is actually being the brave one and go ahead and have that conversation that resolves the conflict. Number two, unresolved guilt. This is where we have too much emphasis on the mistakes we've made in the past. We have too much emphasis on something we did that we wish we had a do-over on. Well, here's the thing, we don't get do-overs. And so we can either obsess over that and worry about it, or we can let it go and submit it to the risen Christ. And so too much guilt causes us to be in the past. Too much unresolved conflict causes us to be in the future. The, the third thing that causes anxiety is unresolved questions. So too much unknown causes anxiety. That, that's part of what we're facing right now. The, the, the issue is, is not so much, will I get sick? The issue is, is how long is this type of life is gonna last? And since no one can answer that, it causes extreme anxiety. And so it causes anxiety about what's our future look like. So the unresolved conflict causes anxiety about them and the future. Unresolved guilt causes anxiety about us and the past. Unresolved question causes anxiety about all of us and how our life's gonna look like. And then the fourth thing is unrealized control. This is where we get confronted with the illusion or the delusion that we can control anything. The truth of it is, is we can't control anything. And sometimes it takes certain circumstances to remind us that life is fragile and we actually have very little control over anything except our response to it. And so what causes anxiety is when we can't control what we're trying to control. You, you see this a lot in relationships. When a relationship goes a bit insecure, and so it's, we're using words like love, but actually what we're trying to do is to control them. And to the level we try to control them is the level we're not loving them, and it's fruitless. I'm, I'm 44 years old, and I have never once ever been able to shift someone who started with their conclusion or who was digging in on their position. Never. We can't control them. And so when we release the idea that we can control them, it releases us from the anxiety of not being able to control them. And when we realize we can't control it, we then surrender them to God. Because when we surrender it to God, it releases us from the anxiety of the control. So four things, unresolved conflict, unresolved guilt, unresolved questions, and unrealized control. Here's Peter's observation in 1 Peter 5, 17. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So number one, we want to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Number two, we want our gentleness to be made known to all, realizing the Lord is near. Number three, we want to surrender the concern. This is Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. We want to surrender. The, once we come to the realization that I've done all I can do, I cannot control them. I cannot control the situation. I don't want to live in unresolved conflict, unresolved guilt, unresolved questions, or unrealized control. I don't want to do that. I'm going to surrender it to God. The, the, the promise is, is that when we can do that, there's a peace that surpasses all understanding to guard us. The fourth thought is this. So one, rejoice. 
Two, let your gentleness be made known to all, realizing God is near. He's at work in me, he's at work in you, he's at work in the whole world and the whole thing's going somewhere beautiful. We, we want to submit and surrender the concern. The fourth is we only want to give helpful thoughts permission to land. This is the very next verse, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so Paul, who's in prison being tortured, he says, here's how he's dealing with his emotions. He only lets thoughts in that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely. And I think there's a great observation here. There's a lot of things that are true, but they're not lovely. There's a lot of things that are pure, but maybe not excellent and praiseworthy. And Paul's filter is, hey, true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, worthy of praise, that we can think about these things. And, and as a psychologist, there are certain things you can't help from flying into your mind, but they fly around. And if you think about Lisa, I fly a lot and every plane has to go into a landing pattern, a circle outside the airport until they're given permission to land. And one of the things I think we could do to help us with these thoughts that cause anxiety is we can see that instead of fighting the thoughts, because if you fight it, you're just gonna empower it. Instead of fighting those thoughts, if we can see them in a landing pattern, say, yep, those thoughts exist. I'm not gonna fight them, but I'm not gonna give them permission to land in my mind. I'm not gonna give them emotional space. If we can do that, then we can, we can start to relieve the symptoms of anxiety. Now, a, a couple questions I want us to, to wrestle with because great sermons aren't meant to be agreed with nor disagreed with. They're meant to be wrestled with in order to apply to our life. So a couple thoughts on that. One, you can't beat anxiety by fighting it. You have to replace it. So a couple questions. Where do we need to increase our awareness of what God is up to? Maybe we could stop back right now and go, wait a minute, where do I see God at work in me, in them, in the whole world? Where's the hand of God in all of this? No, number three, where do we live with the perceived absence? Is there any place where we're living with a perceived absence of God? And maybe we need to step back and go, wait a minute, where is God in this? Number, number four, where do we need to take a deep breath and realize the Lord is actually near and he never left? That God is always with you, always for you, always in front of us. So what would happen if our consciousness wrapped around that? Number five, what is the name of the concern that we need to leave at the throne of the one who's justice and righteousness? So right there, right there, wherever you're watching this, why don't you name the concern, even if it's quiet inside, name it. Because if you can mention it, you can manage it. So, so if, we, if we can name the concern, call it what it is. Ask, is this unrealized conflict? Is this, is this, is this, un, is this unresolved conflict, unresolved guilt? Is this unresolved questions? Is it unrealized? What, where does it fit? Let's name it and surrender it to the throne of the one who's justice and righteousness. Let's say it this way. What thought do we need to deny permission to land? Don't fight it. You only empower it. But if you know it, you could put it in a landing pattern and leave it there. Only let things that are pure, just, lovely, praiseworthy, and true only let those things land so that the peace of God can rule our hearts and mind. I hope Jesus got bigger, the cross worked better, the resurrection central. I hope scriptures got bigger, not smaller. I hope you were inspired today by the life of Paul and his advice on how do you handle worrisome situations. Grace and peace, everybody.